Well, Dan, two weeks off, a new quarterback, same old Bears. He's Dan Weeder from the Chicago Tri- Tribune. I am Dan Miller from ABC7. Um, well, they are who we thought they were. I don't know where else to go right now. Um, I don't think they do either. And I think that is the most devastating part of a fifth straight loss. Well, first of all, I owe you an apology. I owe our audience an apology because I told you last week that this game wasn't going to get ugly score-wise because I had faith that the Bears' defense could slow down Aaron Rodgers. And then Aaron Rodgers went down the field three times in the first half, 75-yard touchdown drive, 75-yard touchdown drive, 80-yard touchdown drive. Mitch Trubisky fumbles. They return that for a touchdown. It's 27-3 to before my kids went to bed. And all of a sudden, (laughs) the entire game is just an absolute mess. I didn't see that effort coming from the defense. We knew that this offense was flawed. Mitch Trubisky's return did very little to enliven that in any significant way that changes the direction of the season. And so here we are, a five-game losing streak. Uh, It's 44 days now since they last experienced a victory and counting because they still have to play more games. Uh, It'll get up to 49 at the minimum this weekend against the Lions. The Bears enter December, Dion, now with, with a lot of questions about whose job is safe, whose job isn't safe, and where do we go from here? No one's job is safe. At least it shouldn't be. They shouldn't feel like it is. This is, as Matt Nagy said, ridiculous and embarrassing. I mean, those were the two biggest words that echoed to me when he on Monday. But honestly, Dan, you're right. This game was over on that first drive for the Packers. Yeah. It He met zero resistance defensively. He had so much time to find Devontae Adams. So much time. And I know your your question to him post game when he explained what he saw, how much he saw on that play right. was so glaringly obvious that the Bears have never had a quarterback who could do that. Who yeah. it, 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 they just they just haven't. I it was the way he described it and to be at like the top of his game it was like, "Wow, what what must that be like <laughs> to to be in that position to know that I, I knew I know what's coming. I can I, I know how to beat what's coming. That I think is where we've what we've missed from the Bears for decades. Yeah. Dan, I called my colleague Colleen Kane at the Tribune at halftime and said, Hey, look, I, I, I'm thinking about going to the Packers post-game Zoom calls. I can't sit through Matt and Mitch post-game with a glum face telling us they're gonna find the whys and get it figured. I can't do this again. I need to go see what life is like on the other side of things. And I did, and I, I came out of those post-game Zooms with Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams with this refreshed feeling of, oh, that's that's what it looks like when you have full command. That's what it looks like when you're fully confident in who you are as an offense. That's what it looks like when you consistently win football games. And Colleen asked me, she said, were, were they really happy in that post-game? I said, no, it was it was just this, this genuine feeling of, that they were pleased, right? It was just that, yeah, hey, we played well in a game that we should have played well in, and we absolutely dominated our rival. And to your point, that question that I asked Rogers about that first touchdown pass to Devontae Adams and what he saw through the entirety of the play, I think his answer was 52 seconds, right? Yes, and so yes. He, he's detailing pre-snap. Okay, here's what I see to the left. Okay, when I take the snap, I see they're in a drop eight coverage, so I know I'm going to have time. And so when my first read's not there, well, now I can shuffle. And I know I can shuffle here because Khalil Mack is double teamed. And because Khalil Mack's double teamed, I feel like I'm not going to get touched. And I've got all the time in the world to look for what I need. Oh, I can even see my tight end slip. And after he slips, I realize, okay, let's reset. Let's let something else come up. Oh, there's my, there, there's my best receiver. He's open. And I know that if I throw it here, there's no one coming from this side of the field to disrupt the pass. I put it up. Devontae Adams catches a touchdown. It's six to nothing Packers. They're never even tied the rest of the night. They lead by double digits for the last 44 minutes and 55 seconds. And there you are, you know? And, and again, just listening to Aaron detail that, it was just like, whoa, you know, you do not hear that level of mastery and command ever from anybody or any quarterback involved in this Bears offense. And that is so accurate. Meantime, back in Loserville over here, they're talking about good throws on fourth down and like bits and pieces of good that it, that just stack up to disaster. That's all it's done all, all season, the last couple of years. That's all we've done is kind of, I'm so sick of looking in the mirror and saying, what the why? We're going to figure out the why. They can't figure anything out. It, they have I, 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 they have to be looking at, at their roster at this point and being like, oh my gosh, we we are tied up here. Like there's there's really no direction to go. I do think 
the defense learning they were not going to have Akeem Hicks was a big deal. Okay. No so question. that is incredibly significant. We learned it last year. We saw it again on Sunday. No 96 is a very big deal. And it makes a huge difference on everybody. I, it was, and you could tell, and I don't know if that deflated them coming out or, or did they already know they were beat? I mean, Aaron Rodgers, as we just said, top O oh, his game. Like that's yeah. where he's at. The Bears defense rarely gives up three touchdowns in a game, much less three in succession, much less three consecutive touchdowns to start the game. And so it just got away from them really quick. And it was so uncharacteristic because we're used to this defense standing up and making a play yeah. and, and, and keeping this team in a game. And they didn't. Now, what's interesting to me, Dion, is that on Monday morning when Matt met with us over his Zoom call, he felt very confident and comfortable in, in really making a public rebuke of the defensive effort on Sunday night. And I sort of sat up and thought, he better understand what he's doing here. And, and, he, and he was asked about it again in the Zoom call about why he felt the urge and the comfort level, I guess, in calling out the defense. And he said, listen, they're big boys. They can take it. They understand they didn't play well, and I'm not telling them anything they don't know. But for me, if I'm a, a player on that defense and I, I'm saying, yeah, I know I played like crap on Sunday night, but your offense has been playing like crap for three years. Yes. And, and there hasn't been this level of anger and agitation and frustration publicly expressed toward that on a consistent basis and so be careful here coach you know you we are the reason that you've had any shreds of success whatsoever, whatsoever. Over the last three seasons so so be careful with how sharp you come at me otherwise I might start to tune you out a little bit uh plus you're losing I mean start to tune him out I I, I feel like like with us in the media we run the same sound bites for weeks uh, um years every time they we, we've run the same storyline that's all they're hearing. We're going to cling to the positives. We've got a bunch of fighters. Yeah, and I know, we know right. uh, it, it, it doesn't translate on Sunday for whatever reason. If he says one time this week that Mitch had a great week of practice, I mean, I just could vomit. It's just infuriating. And and yet here they sit with their hands tied, five straight losses. I, I, I'm not sure. what. I don't have confidence that, that anything's going to change on Sunday against a, a Detroit team that doesn't have a coach. I mean, they have an interim coach. And they're, they're in disarray as well. And I put my money on them right now. I feel like the Bears are that big of a mess. You said last week that, that you, you were tired of reheating up the Thanksgiving leftovers and, and having the same meal over and over again. Now the Thanksgiving leftovers have mold on them. And now we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're they're right back on our table and we're trying to figure out what to do with them. Neither you or I took the bait on the Mitch had a good week of practice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you want to call it, narrative, rhetoric, whatever came out of House Hall last week. We didn't believe Matt Nagy's, you know, endorsement that he had a different focus about him and that it was somehow going to make a difference in his play. We've watched Mitch for four seasons and we know who he is. And part of my uh, resistance to the idea of Trisky coming back into the huddle and running this offense is, is I have a great respect for Mitch Trubisky, the dude, right? Like this guy is an unselfish Same. team first grinder, never complains, is professional in every aspect of the every world. Aspect, and it's yeah. really difficult to have to put him back under the spotlight and say, yep, he's still not good at quarterback. And it happened Sunday night. It happened on a national stage. And, you know, there was this thought process that his legs and his athleticism were going to give the Bears offense a dimension that it hadn't had with Nick Foles. Well, you know how many plays that Mitch Trubisky made with his legs on Sunday night? I counted one. There was a 11-yard scramble for a first down. That doesn't compensate for throwing an interception into double coverage, followed by an interception into triple coverage, losing a fumble for a touchdown, running out of bounds for a three-yard sack. You know, this is, these are the things that are they're, they're just mistakes that we've seen before. They're not changing, and yet we've got to continue to watch this play out on this stage with five more games left in the season. It's a long way to go yet, and, <laughs> and we're continuing to talk about this. And, and, and yeah, I, do, I just don't, I don't know where we pivot to in this entire conversation other than how hot is everyone's chair, you know? Well, no, agreed, agreed. And, and honestly, like, they did this to Mitch trading up to select him second overall. They put him in this position. He is not capable of doing that. And and salt in the wound, I know, but NBC on Sunday night, like it shows this graphic of the highest passer rating ever in a game. And oh, look at that, Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. They're like a video game. And here is Mitch making a good fourth down play. And Tony Dungy's talking about them like there's some peewee team. Like it was embarrassed. It was embarrassing. And to have Virginia McCaskey, have a front row eyewitness seat to this as close as she could get there. This, the family has to be frustrated. Now they've never fired anybody in season. That is well documented. They've waited until the end. 
I feel like that's what this is. So now, now you have a coach that everybody expects to be, you know, a fired man walking around right now, a GM as well. Like, is this, are they going to clean house? I guess that's my next question. You, do you anticipate them cleaning house at the end of this season? So my answer to this always in the season is that there's a long way to go. And there's a lot of chapters left to write in this book. And maybe Matt Nagy can find something where they get, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a burst and, the, and they're able to win three of five on the way out. And it looks like things that, you know, from a, are a little bit more acceptable than they've been through this five game losing streak, which has been miserable. Not only a five game losing streak, but they weren't in the game against the Titans. They weren't in the game against the Packers the other night. Yeah. They weren't in the game against the Rams, right? They, they, they were blown out in those three games. They didn't play well against the Vikings after they took the lead on the Cordero Patterson kick return. And so it's not all about the end record. It's how it looks on the way out the door. And so these last five weeks are going to be key. I remember last year, Dan, Patrick Mahomes came to Soldier Field and absolutely drove the nail in the most disappointing season that yeah. Bears fans can remember in the last 25, 30 years, right? Deshaun Watson <laughs> is coming to Soldier Field next week in December. If you lose that game with the other quarterback that you didn't take number two overall in 2017, driving the nail in the coffin, it is just going to be another high profile. Oh God, that's so ugly. Oh, by the way, to your point, they play a Lions team on Sunday at Soldier Field that, you know, yes, they've just blown the whole thing up. They fired their GM, they fired their coach, but they have an identical record since these two teams met at Ford Field in week one, four and six. They also, like the Bears, lost 41 to 25 on Thanksgiving Day. This isn't a gimme win. The Bears have beaten the Lions four straight over the last two years, but those haven't been convincing wins in any way, shape, or form. And so, no, it's not a gimme win. And if you lose at home to a team that just blew itself up, oh my God, the conversation next week could be nuclear. Uh, Dan, nothing is a gimme win with this team. Can we no. just confirm that? I mean, yeah, it is, confirmed. it is there on, it's getting far. <laughs> we are checking it off. I mean, Okay, so but I want to I want to say something positive because I'm not trying to like bury the obvious here. Like clearly, it was grotesque what happened on a national stage. Again, I, I'm going to file a complaint to the NFL. I do think we need to request the league not put the Bears in prime time anymore because it is embarrassing. But they finally got a 100 yard rusher. Finally, I mean, yeah, it was garbage, but finally. Uh, Montgomery, that run, that 57 yard run was so pretty. And it was, okay, do more of that. That worked. Like, and then, um, th then we couldn't do anything else. And that was with that shuffled offensive line. It was with Cody Whitehair playing, I think his true position. And it was, it, it opened up that role, that hole for him. And it was, it was so pretty. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, offense. And then, you know, three points. So, but at least something good was there, something to build on. I don't know. It was, it was something positive that should give them a little bit of confidence on the ground. I mean, we're, we're grabbing at straws here. We're totally grabbing at straws, but I do think that the shuffles on the offensive line were helpful. It didn't seem like Mitch Trubisky was under the constant duress that Nick Foles had been under uh, in recent weeks. It felt like they had a little bit more stability in their pass protection, yeah. that they were able to do some things in the running game that got things going. But again, this is all just minutia in the middle of a giant wreck, right? I mean, it really is. And, 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 and when we have this discussion of, you know, should it be Mitch going forward? Should it be Nick? Again, I go back to what I've been saying since August. This was never about is Mitch better than Nick? Is Nick better than Mitch? Is either one of these guys good enough to guide this team in the playoffs? We enter December with a clear-cut answer to that. There are flames shooting up from underneath the mangled hood of this of this vehicle, right? And And that's – that's where we are. And so, look, NBC showed you that graphic at the end of the first half. It was Ryan Pace, Matt Nagy, Mitch Trubisky, general manager, head coach, quarterback. Those three are the most important positions in your entire football operation. Absolutely. And we cannot sit here on December 1st, 2020 and say that any of those men will be in those roles for this organization when the 2021 season starts. And so that's where the focus and the attention kind of has to be for the short term. At least they keep it. Uh, you know, like something for us to talk about, give us plenty of things to dissect every single week. You know, Alan Robinson last night, yesterday asked on Twitter, um, how long is too long to keep eating leftovers? And I argue they better go to the grocery store and revamp that meal. Like I am so tired of being served that I hope that next weekend, no matter what it looks like, that we don't hear the same blah, blah, blah afterwards about, you know, great play from these guys. I mean, Trubisky's playing for his career. 
Right. And I argue Nagy's coaching for his. I mean, and not just in Chicago, but wherever he may end up um, and what however this may unfold. I know the family likes him a lot, but though they also like to win. Right. You know, and, and I don't think it's just about the Packers game. I think it's the way that this franchise is now being reflected around the league after a five and one start that was clearly fool's gold. And now and, and now where they sit looking looking down this slide that looks like it's not going in, it's not changing. I, yeah. I don't, there's the confidence in it changing is like mm, gone. I mean, we talked last week that these Packers matchups in prime time can be these sort of illuminations of every single thing that's wrong with your franchise. The Bears got that again, Sunday night at Lambeau okay. Field. And it was a reminder of just how wide the gap is between that franchise and this one. Aaron Rodgers, yeah. by the way, is about to, to go to the playoffs for the 10th time. He's been to the NFC title game four times, could go there for a, a fifth time this year, the way they're playing right now. And so you say, wow, you know, that's what it looks like. That's what it sounds like. That's what it feels like. Can't we get a little taste of that? And and you know that Virginia McCaskey and George McCaskey and the others at the, the high levels of that organization feel that, right? They feel the frustration. They're in tune to what the fans are feeling. And they're not going to make knee-jerk reactions and just do things because there's a outside discontent. But they hear. You know, they, they're listening. Mm -hmm. they, they understand. And so, again, there's five more chapters of this year's story to write. And those chapters are going to tell us a lot about the the leadership of this, this team and, and whether – to your point, do they have any answers? And at this point, particularly offensively, they've had no answers. They are a 500 football team that is mm -hmm. lost, stuck, now maybe broken. You know, can we add that word yeah. to our? I, no, <laughs> oh, they are broken at this point. And I, yeah, I, I got nothing. Like it's rare that I'm without words. And after uh, however many minutes we just talked, like I'm seriously done. Like I have nothing else to say. <laughs> I've got I've got words for you. Bears, Lions, Soldier Field, noon Sunday. Let's go. Yeah, you're gonna be excited about it for real. I don't know. If <laughs> I've I got am. to be. I, what's my other choice? Every week we watch like this. We watch <laughs> with embarrassment like this. Oh my gosh. At least we're at least our jobs are safe. That's right. For now. For now. <laughs> for now. Don't, don't don't play with fire here, Dion. <laughs>